Hi, I'm Travis Lane, and this is part two of my review of Ayn Rand's work, The Fountainhead. Though this is a fiction book, it's really a vessel for portraying and exploring the philosophy of objectivism, Ayn Rand's controversial but long-standing philosophy. As such, I broke my review into two separate bits. In part one, I talked about The Fountainhead as a work of fiction. In this video, I'll dig a little deeper into the philosophy element including references to postscript and interview material that's outside of the book itself. If you want to watch my review of the fiction and the writing, a link is in the description to part one. As a warning, while I avoided major plot spoilers and plot elements in the first part of the review, I'll be a little bit more loose with them here, so if you intend to read the book yourself, you may want to wait to watch this until after you do so. It won't be blatant spoiling, but to unlock some of the philosophical discussion, I need a little leeway with the character development and plot points, so consider yourself warned. Here's a summary of Rand's philosophy in her own words. My philosophy, in essence, is the concept of man as a heroic being, with his own happiness as the moral purpose of his life, with productive achievement as his noblest activity, and reason as his only absolute. The back of my copy of The Fountainhead contains a postscript titled The Essentials of Objectivism. Here are some of her key principles. Metaphysics. Reality exists independent of man's consciousness. The task of man's consciousness is to perceive reality, not to create or invent it. Objectivism rejects any belief in the supernatural. Number two, epistemology. Man's reason is fully competent to know the facts of reality. Reason is man's only means of acquiring knowledge. Objectivism rejects mysticism, any acceptance of faith or feeling as a means of knowledge. And it rejects skepticism, the claim that certainty of knowledge is impossible. 3. Human nature. Man is a rational being. Reason, as man's only means of knowledge, is his basic means of survival. But the exercise of reason depends on each individual's choice. Objectivism rejects any form of determinism, the belief that man is a victim of forces beyond his control, such as God, fate, upbringing, genes, or economic conditions. Number four, ethics. Man is an end in himself, not a means to the ends of others. He must live for his own sake, neither sacrificing himself to others, nor sacrificing others to himself. He must work for his rational self-interest, with the achievement of his own happiness as the highest moral purpose of his life. Objectivism rejects any form of altruism, the claim that morality consists in living for others or for society. Number five, politics. Capitalism is a system based on the recognition of individual rights, including property rights, in which the only function of the government is to protect individual rights, i.e., to protect men from those who initiate the use of physical force. Objectivism rejects any form of collectivism, such as fascism or socialism, it also rejects the current mixed economy notion that the government should regulate the economy and redistribute wealth. Number six, aesthetics. The purpose of art is to concretize the artist's fundamental view of existence. It is the presentation of men as they ought to be. The most common term I can think of that strongly aligns with Rand's philosophy is secular humanism, which, according to Google Dictionary, is humanism with regard in particular to the belief that humanity is capable of morality and self-fulfillment without belief in God. Going through her principles, I have no issue accepting points one and two as axiomatic assumptions. There is, of course, deeper philosophical history and debate over whether reality is objective and real or whether man's senses are sufficient enough to perceive it, but overall, they're fair premises to start with. They're also important in setting the stage for what Rand wants to assert later, with man being the center of her values. Principle three, that man is a rational being, I take partial issue with. I would restate it that man has the capacity for rationality, but has some default and instinctual behaviors and biases that are anything but rational. I'm too heavily influenced by proofs of natural irrationality to fully accept this point. In particular, books like Thinking Fast and Slow, from behavioral economist Daniel Kahneman, and the further work of Richard Thaler, consider as evidence just the title of his book, Quasi-Rational Economics, show that theories and philosophies that rely on the intrinsic rationality of man are not accurate predictors of true human behavior. In the real world, humans are homo sapiens, not homo economicus, the imaginary variant of man that is perfectly rational. 
I also think that evolutionary biology contradicts with this principle. Some fears and biases stem primarily from the less civilized history of our ancestors. For instance, the common fear of the dark has been attributed to uh, ancient survival advantage that has long overstayed its welcome. It's a great trade-off to be occasionally scared of nothing in the midst of sensory deprivation. Caution, without a threat, costs nothing, but lack of caution in the midst of an unseen threat meant, you know, eaten by leopard. A simple syllogism exploring this conflict would look something like, premise one, according to principle two, man's perception of reality is accurate. Premise two, According to principle three, man is rational. Premise three, the scientific method is based on human observation and rational inference. Therefore, conclusion, if science disagrees with one of Rand's principles, it presents a true philosophical conflict. While it might seem pedantic, well, that's philosophical assessment. The more potent and practical criticism is that of her point four, that each man is an end unto himself in that his main purpose is the pursuit of his own happiness. But actually, while I disagree with Rand's outright disdain for altruism, I think that this point has the most enduring value. Rand uses the word egotist frequently in her writing, but translated into modern lingo, I don't think Anne Rand would have any beef with more palatable terms like authenticity, self-acceptance, or the phrase allowing yourself to be happy. Even in her distaste for altruism, it isn't as if she's advising a complete disregard of other people. Her ideal man, Howard Rourke, has friendships, even self-sacrificial ones. He's just very steadfast about his ideals taking priority. He has no problem creating value for other people, and even expresses concern for the poor in righteous indignation over the artificial price inflation of the Cortland Project. It's just that he sees adherence to his personal ideals as being the best way to pursue happiness for himself and creating value for other people. The other thing to keep in mind when interpreting Rand's writings is the environment that she grew up in. Her family's property and her father's business were seized in the Russian revolutions that led to Bolshevik rule in the late 1910s. This early exposure to state-sponsored collectivism would heavily influence her political views. Of course, my saying that conflicts with her third principle, which states that no deterministic forces influence a person. She would probably be offended that I suggested that her upbringing influenced her political views later in life. However, I think there's a pretty clear line between your property seized by the government and a distaste for government. You can be the judge. While her mistaste for collectivism is understandable given the political environment of her formative years, her principles preclude the idea that any force besides government can repress self-actualization. While she does concede that government should have some limited power to keep people from using force to take from others, she does not recognize that businesses can also have a deleterious effect on innovation. Monopolistic power, the formation of cartels, and the more recent buyout culture of the 80s and 90s that has persisted into today shows that unfettered capitalism can do things to stifle independence. And this provides a perfect segue to Rand's writing and beliefs have influenced social and political movements for at least the seven decades since the publishing of Atlas Shrugged. In the 1960s, her views sliced off a libertarian section of the conservative bloc, separating the capitalist views from the religious ones and injecting Rand's atheism into a political view. The libertarian celebration of individual rights, minimally regulated capitalism, and departure from both religious belief and blind patriotism would be celebrated and endorsed by Rand. Where it gets trickier is in the buyout culture of the 1980s that has persisted until today. Major corporations simply buying out their competition when they're threatened by disruption is arguably detrimental to innovation and self-determination. While she would argue that being able to enjoy the fruits of success are a font of creativity, and incumbency and the first mover advantage are natural benefits of innovation, the fact that businesses today may actually deter competition by their monopolistic behavior would be detestable to her. I honestly wonder where she would place the importance of government in preventing anti-competitive behavior in the modern economy. After all, in The Fountainhead, Howard Rourke is effectively a small businessman fighting against a consortium of incumbents in his line of work and influencing it. The stodgy, old-fashioned businesses are the villains. Furthermore, Rand's writing should not be seen as an explicit promotion of any business, even a successful one. Arguably, the two most powerful and successful people in the book are not portrayed as heroes. Peter Keating, while he's able to climb the greasy rungs of the corporate ladder, 
is completely villainized throughout the entire work as a know-nothing, talentless hack. And when we're introduced to Gail Winand, it's basically with a gun to his head ready to take his own life. Rourke also says of Winand that the people who pursue power are actually the worst kind of people. Rand also held many distinctly liberal viewpoints. Liberal in both the meaning of limited government interference in personal behavior and in the standard left-wing deck of beliefs in modern politics. Strong support of women's rights, opposition to the death penalty, strong support for civil rights and minority rights, decriminalization of all drugs, and not a supporter of individual gun ownership. All of this to say that Rand and objectivism have some aspects that align closely with the conservative Republican view of economics, but similarly, she champions a lot of individual liberties that are more commonly fought for on the left-wing Democratic side. In the end, Rand is at home under the modern libertarian flag. While she's been co-opted by some key players in the Republican right, there is as much or more in the right-wing standard deck of beliefs that she would disagree with. Of course, while there are some elements of personal freedoms and government non-intervention on the Democrat side, she would abhor social programs and be strongly opposed to increased government intervention, either by regulation or increasing of federal-level programs. Calling her a champion of either of the major political parties is a little bit like watching The Wolf of Wall Street and wanting to be Jordan Belfort, or watching Fight Club and wanting to be Tyler Durden. If that's how you feel, you may have missed the point. By the way, none of this should be seen as agreement or an endorsement from me, just an analysis of a complex and divisive character whose brand has, if anything, grown in the decades since her death. We owe ourselves the ability to objectively and dispassionately assess something, to take what we feel is valuable, and to dispense with the rest. Objectivism is not perfect, and it isn't seriously regarded by most true philosophers, whatever that means but it offers some solid lessons in self-confidence, passion for creating value, and consistence to personal ideals. Once again, if you've stuck with me this long, it is much appreciated. I really enjoy doing this, and I hope that you enjoy it too. If you want to pick up a copy of The Fountainhead, again, there will be a link in the description of this video. Uh, the version that I was given as a gift was a double copy of The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. I'll link both in the description. Again, that's an Amazon affiliates link, so if you purchase it, it costs you nothing additional. I get a small reference from Amazon for the suggestion. And as always, I'll be back for more. If you like this video, please like it. And if you'd like to see more of my content when I post it, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. I intend to read my 10 books this year and provide a response and a review of each one of them. I hope that will be uh, interesting and there will be uh, much more value. It was. Totally an accident that, uh, that the first two were so philosophical. The next one will be a little bit something different. So thank you again for your attention, for your viewership. I really appreciate it and enjoy it, and I'll see you soon. In particular, books like Thinking Fast and... Eh, let's just go get it. Why not? Why not? We'll be with it.